I'm Terry Lohman. I'm the co-chair for UU's for Just Economic Community. And tonight we have three experts on investor state dispute settlements. Have to think what the ISDS uh, is. Um, and it's really an important topic because it's a major obstacle for countries passing laws um, to protect the environment. They can pass a law to do it, and then a mining company can sue them for billions of dollars. Um, you're talking small Latin American countries often that the, uh, the mining company has something approaching their GDP, uh, which they can't afford to pay out billions. Um, let's see. Stephanie is the research director for Global Trade Watch, providing an in-depth information on uh, an array of international trade issues. Before joining Public Citizen, she worked as an international arbitration and trade attorney representing Latin American governments in ISDS arbitration. She attended Duke Law and received a Master of Law degree from Georgetown University Law Center, where she specializes in international trade studies. Thank you Great. so much. And hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to be talking to you about the basics of ISDS with the help of Stuart. Um, if you could please show the presentation, we can dive in. Thank you so much. So we'll start off with the first slide. Um, I think if you could, yeah, there we go. So what is ISDS? Um, ISDS, sometimes mistakenly called investment state or investor state, it really doesn't matter. The point is, is that it's corporations suing governments um, over a foreign investment, over a perceived slight in a foreign investment. And the point is that any government action, whether it's a policy or a regulation can be attacked, even if it's for the greater good, even if it's to protect the environment or indigenous communities, it is essentially a private arbitration um, that is typically hosted by the World Bank under ICSID, which is the, um, the, investment, the investment center dispute um, institute. And that is where the disputes are heard by typically a panel of three attorneys um, and they hear the dispute and then they um, issue the award and the taxpayers are the ones who ultimately bear that burden. So it started out, it first cropped up in the 60s, like 50s, 60s in bilateral investment treaties. And then it really took off in the 90s um, in the investment chapters of free trade agreements, the first one being NAFTA. Next slide, please. So it is no coincidence that ISDS was introduced following the last major wave of former European colonies gaining their independence. So we're talking 1950s, 1960s, also following the eras of the banana republics in Central America where corporations took over and essentially dictated how governments were to behave and how um, foreign policy was to be conducted. And so this system was sold to former colonies by Western nations as a beneficial tool for attracting foreign investment. And that was desperately needed at, at the time for economic growth and development following the centuries of exploitation by colonial powers. However, ISDS was really conceived as a way to protect European companies that continue to operate in former colonies that were concerned that these new governments would nationalize the industries that they were profiting from. So the former colonies faced with economic vulnerability, inexperience in negotiating these complex agreements, and not to mention like the internal pressure to grow their economies, mm -hmm. they agreed to adopt ISDS. Um, next slide, please. So 
the way that it was sold, as I mentioned, um, was with the benefits, right? So the proponents of ISDS claim that it is a system that is fair and impartial and disputes can be resolved peacefully as opposed to using one party's legal system um, and therefore it is neutral. And they also like to claim things like stability and predictability. However, um, after years of working in the trenches representing foreign governments, um, I can I can tell you for certain that none of that is true. Um, we can go to the next slide. So the reality is that the only ones claiming ISDS is positive are the same people benefiting from it and profiting from it, either through legal representation, um, tribunal appointments, arbitration centers themselves, and of course, corporations love ISDS. Um, so the reality for governments is actually quite bleak, as I mentioned, what they fail to disclose here. They have overly broad rights, which means that corporations get special treatment that domestic corporations wouldn't typically get. Um, and these go beyond protecting the expropriation of their investments and the rights corporations would have in a domestic legal system. Because even if a law has not been passed, if let's say the government is just thinking and talking and doing research um, that could potentially lead to a law or a regulation being passed, these corporations can launch ISDS disputes against them and you know, claim that this change could impact their future profits. And just with that, they could get millions of dollars and prevent that law from being passed in the, you know, in the first place. And then the other issue that we have with ISDS is the secrecy. Um, these are secret panels of, arbit of arbiters. No one is allowed in unless they are parties and the parties are just the government and the corporation. And they're secret because even the communities harmed by the investment, um, they're not invited typically and the award amounts are often undisclosed. So as taxpayers, you pay all of these things and have no idea. You're just left wondering why roads aren't being built or why you know healthcare systems aren't getting the money that they need or schools. Um, and for context, the average ISDS case seeks $1.6 billion in damages. There we go. So the harms of ISDS. ISDS harms all communities, but I wanna make a point to say that indigenous communities are particularly vulnerable to the effects of ISDS and experience what is known as a triple losing scenario. And this is because indigenous people typically live on land that is highly sought after by foreign investors because it's rich in minerals or close to water, uh, bodies of water, what have you. So what these foreign corporations typically do is they go in and set up shop with very little regard for the communities and oftentimes destroy ancestral lands, ways of life, and complete livelihoods for communities. And governments are often caught between a rock and a hard place because they have to choose between protecting you know, um, the indigenous communities or appeasing these foreign investors to avoid ISDS disputes. And what we have seen is that even when governments side with corporations, it is not a guarantee that they won't launch an ISDS case against them anyway and cost them millions, if not billions of dollars. Next slide, please. And here we have an example. This is a case that is near and dear to my heart, um, Bear Creek v. Peru. So as you can see in the image, this is Lake Titicaca, which was once considered sacred by the Inca indigenous people who live there. And as you can see there, it was home to an indigenous community that relied on that lake heavily for fishing and farming. So when a Canadian mining company decided to exploit the area's silver, the community protested, saying it would ruin them because mining had been known in the region to be a very dirty industry and had already caused extensive damage in Peru. 
And as you may know, Peru is a target for precious metal mining anyway. So the indigenous community was very familiar with what was gonna happen. So the Peruvian government actually deployed armed forces against the indigenous community, but the corporation launched the case anyway. <laughs> And even though the tribunal admitted that the corporation had an obligation to consult with the local community and obtain their permission to set up the mining project and failed to do so, the tribunal still sided with the corporation and Peru had to pay. So let's go to the next slide. And here is the aftermath. As you can see today, Lake Titicaca, once beautiful, is now covered in trash and toxic cyanide runoff from the mines since that's the cheapest way to separate the silver from the rocks. And so the corporations get to save a few bucks and poison the environment at the same time. Let's go to the next one. This is another example. So Chevron v. Ecuador. Um, between the 70s and the 90s, US oil giant Chevron um, dumped toxic waste and crude oil directly into the Amazon rainforest. This led to countless harms, including the extinction of an Amazonian tribe that had been there for centuries. Um, a domestic court in Ecuador found the corporation liable yeah. and ordered them to pay for the harms to the communities. But oh. instead of paying, Chevron sued Ecuador through ISDS, and the tribunal ultimately sided with Chevron. Um, the indigenous communities and the neighboring people whose livelihoods have been totally destroyed have yet to obtain justice, and it's very likely that they never will. Um, they were not even allowed to submit an amicus brief um, for the tribunal's consideration explaining what happened and, you know, given, giving their firsthand account as the people who experienced the harm. And I think that this adds insult to injury to say the least you know like a company comes in does all of this damage to an indigenous community and they're not even allowed to explain what happened for the ruling to even be considered so let's go to the next one so after all of that i think it's fair to say that it's apparent that the system really only works for corporations and i'm very glad to see in recent years that governments have begun taking steps away from ISDS. Um, and that, that has really been wonderful to see. A very recent example is Honduras um, in the past few weeks has announced that they are exiting from the ICSID convention, which means that ISDS cases after the sunset clause period passes, they will not be able to bring cases against them anymore through this mechanism which is a great step. Other countries have already begun to do that. Even in the United States, even President Biden has said that he will not be negotiating any agreements, bilateral investment treaties or free trade agreements with ISDS provisions. I think that as a whole, everybody is realizing what a harmful tool this really is and how it really resembles that neo-colonial structure um, that is not great to say the least. So <laughs> I want to thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, uh, shoot me an email if you'd like. I will also be speaking at a rally for the World Bank spring meetings on Friday, where I'll be talking about this outside of the World Bank headquarters. So if you happen to be in DC around noon next Friday, I look forward to seeing you there. And I will pass it over to Stu. Thank you so much. OK, Stuart True is the <clears throat> Director of the Trade and Investment Research Project at the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, a progressive think tank based in Ottawa, Canada. He has written numerous books, chapters, and articles on the interactions of trade rules and public interest regulations and policy, and co-edited with Scott Sinclair the 2016 anthology, The TPP and Canada, A Citizen's Guide. He is currently researching a report, again with Scott Sinclair, on NAFTA, on the NAFTA record of investor state dispute settlement cases, with focus on the three-year legacy period following the ratification of the uh, new U.S., Mexico, and Canada uh, trade agreement. Thank you, Stuart.
Well, no, thank you, Terry. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, nice to see everybody on the call. Um, thanks also, Stephanie, for that incredible uh, opening uh, session on ISDS. It's, um, this is going to hopefully uh, build on that. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. And let me know if people can see this. Does that look OK? Yep. Yes. OK. Mm -hmm. Great. So there not, we go. Not very OK, but yeah. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. Not, not very OK, exactly. So, uh, so again, thank you very much. Um, my title is, you know, maybe a little sensationalist, uh, maybe not. Um, but I would say, you know, the lawyers and arbitrators who make so much money off of this system that Stephanie um, just told us a lot about, um, they would probably say ISDS is not the thing that's harming the planet, right? It's it's people doing harmful things. But but I I don't think that's true. I think ISDS plays a much bigger role, um, as, again, as Stephanie was mentioning. It's clear to a lot of people today, including to a growing number of people inside the industry itself, inside the investor state industry, as, as I call it, that uh, that ISDS is much more than that, right? It's, it's a very substantial legal barrier, for one thing, um, to, uh, to stopping people and stopping ourselves um, from doing harmful things uh, to the planet, um, which uh, Terry alluded to at the beginning of this meeting. Now, ISDS is designed to facilitate extraction, uh, as I'm sure Manuel will point out um, after, uh, after I finish my presentation. Um, and that includes extraction of stuff like oil and gold and gas, uh, obviously, but also the extraction of wealth out of public hands uh, and into private bank accounts in, in, in a ta one tax haven or, or another. You know, it's, uh, and that's especially true with respect to um, developed developing world or north-south relations, again, as Stephanie was saying there. A lot of money being sucked out of these countries. Um, and then they're stuck dealing with these ISDS, ISDS cases, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, to me, ISDS is about preserving the status quo of wealth and power inequality in the world today. If we get rid of ISDS, we therefore are in a better position to rebalance that situation and get rid of a formid formidable obstacle in the way of more rapid and effective policies to protect our world. Now, the photo here, just as an aside, uh, for those who don't recognize it, it's, uh, it shows a 14,000 barrel oil spill from Canadian company TC Energy's existing Keystone pipeline in rural Kansas from December 2022. Um, TC Energy is now suing the U.S. Uh, for $15 billion under NAFTA and, and the USMCA for Biden's cancellation of the expansion plan for that pipeline. So you can kind of understand from pictures like that why people uh, don't want to see this thing expanded. So in terms of the summary of my presentation, um, I'm going to go over a few of the higher profile climate related ISDS cases in the global north, um, including Canada, the United States and Europe, uh, that uh, show that, you know, serve as examples of the barrier that investment treaties place on climate action. Um, you know, uh, Stephanie mentioned some of the ones, uh, other cases from the global south already. I'm sure Manuel will have others uh, in his presentation as well. I hope that you'll be able to see how these cases create a huge liability risk um, to governments. Research has shown that the threat of a significant ISDS case can lead governments to change or cancel planned policies. Uh, even, uh, but even where governments move forward in the face of ISDS threats, we should not accept that they should have to pay polluters to stop polluting, right? So even victories um, you know, uh, are, are not exactly victories when it comes to ISDS. Um, finally, I'll talk a bit about the international backlash. And again, this is following up very nicely from, from Stephanie, uh, talking about what people are saying, um, people, countries turning away from it, and uh, some incredible civil society activism to stop this uh, ISDS regime. Okay, so the first case I'll talk about uh, is Ruby River versus Canada. Some of you may know a little bit about this. Um, they had initially filed a $20 billion la lawsuit against Canada. Uh, it, it's gone down a little bit, but it's potentially gonna go up by the end of the case, right? So now they're saying they need at least a billion, but they're gonna revise that on an ongoing basis. And it's potentially could get back up to $20 billion depending on when the award uh, is, is handed down. Um, it's a, a really big example of the troubling excesses of investor state dispute settlement, especially in an era of uh, urgently needed climate action. So Canada, came to a clear and transparent decision to say no to a major fossil fuel project that would have increased global greenhouse em gas emissions significantly. Um, the company, on the other hand, claims Canada acted in a, quote, fundamentally arbitrary 
procedurally grossly unjust, expropriatory, and discriminatory, end quote, fashion. Um, the case shows how private arbitration panels established under investment treaties are empowered to second guess government actions to address the climate emergency. And at a deeper level, the Ruby River case exposes the challenges that ISDS creates for democratic decision making and meaningful public participation in things like environmental um, impact assessments, for example, of major fossil fuel projects. We want and we need governments to be democratic, open, and thorough in their reviews of new projects uh, for their environmental and social impacts. ISDS cases like this discourage that in a, in a very significant way in both the global north and the global south. So the next case, uh, probably quite familiar to people on the call, um, it's, uh, it's been mentioned uh, already, I believe, as well. Um, I won't go into too much detail. The basics here should be enough to indicate how expensive climate-related ISDS cases can be. Uh, TC Energy is not even the most e expensive case currently, as we'll see in a moment. Um, despite having demonstrably leaky pipelines, uh, continued legal uncertainty about the pipeline in the US and the obvious need to stop approving new fossil fuel projects, uh, TC Energy claims that the decision was unfair. So this is the second decision of the Biden administration to cancel the, uh, the plan, the pipeline, following Obama's initial um, cancellation, which also attracted a $15 billion lawsuit that was later from Keystone that was later kind of paused. So they assert that the cancellation violates NAFTA articles 1102 and 1103, which is basically national treatment and most favored nation treatment protections. Um, and they say that that's the case because other similar U.S.-based pipelines continue to operate, you know, which is a ridiculous argument, right? <laughs> of course, they continue to operate, um, but you have to start somewhere. Um, they also, uh, they claim that uh, it, it, are, it violates Article 1110 uh, on expropriation. So because the effect on future lost earnings of this cancellation, which is where you get this huge valuation. Um, TC Energy's ISDS case focuses on the claim that its investments were not given fair and equitable treatment uh, as well under, under NAFTA Article 1105. So the U.S. defense in this case is very interesting, and maybe we'll end up talking about this later in the Q&A. There's not, not much time to do it now, but basically the U.S. is claiming that TC Energy's case is void since it involves events that uh, took place after NAFTA. Biden canceled this in, in early 2021. NAFTA was replaced by USMCA in July 2020, and therefore... Uh, NAFTA's investment protection cannot be applied to this case. Um, it's kind of an interesting argument. We kind of hope it's true and we hope it's validated because it would mean the Ruby River case would go away as well. Uh, but anyway, that's stuff we can talk about in the Q&A if people are interested. Um, and, and just so you know, the photo here is of Shane Redhawk of the Sioux tribe from South Dakota. Uh, he's in the middle with the headdress. Um, with other Native Americans, farmers, ranchers, and, and cowboys during the Reject the Project, or sorry, Reject and Protect rally to protest against the Keystone XL pipeline in April 2014. Okay, so the next case, the last one I'll talk about um, is uh, in Europe. These two cases related to the Netherlands phase out of coal fired power. Uh, they're notorious cases in Europe. Uh, trade justice activists and many governments cite these cases as reasons why countries should withdraw from investment treaties like the Energy Charter Treaty, under which both of these cases were filed. In that sense, they produce some good news as well as bad, um, as we'll talk about in a second, <clears throat> because countries are starting to pull out from the Energy Charter Treaty. Um, for our purposes, it's enough just to point out that even phasing out the most polluting form of energy, coal, right, uh, is, is more challenging than it needs to be due to investment treaties uh, with ISDS. A very similar case has been launched against Canada by the U.S.-based Westmoreland Coal Company, which is claiming that the Alberta government's decision to speed up its phase-out of coal-powered coal-powered uh, coal-powered uh, energy, uh, and Canada's decision to do the same nationally, uh, that that those decisions to speed up and actually uh, you know react to the climate emergency violate um, its NAFTA rights to fair treatment and its protections against indirect expropriation in, in NAFTA and the USMCA. So the Westmoreland case has been withdrawn once, it's been tossed out in a different form. It's kind of an odd case, but it's currently slinking its way through another form, uh, one of these legacy cases as we talked about, which is cases that took place after NAFTA became USMCA in this weird three-year three period uh, that ended uh, last summer. 
So here's just some more examples of some very expensive claims. Um, and, and you can see these claims are getting more expensive and they will get more expensive as they involve um, highly lucrative projects, fossil fuel projects, um, extractive projects, renewable power uh, projects. Um, and you can see the Ruby River and TC Energy cases right there among the top most expensive in the world. Of course, in this, this important one that Manuel might talk about um, in, in Mexico. So next slide, um, how big is the liability? Well, this is just, uh, you know, I'll let you read through that. This is just uh, fossil fuel cases. This doesn't involve mining. This doesn't involve cases involving public services or cases where states are being sued for responding to the COVID emergency. Um, there's some amazing cases out there. Um, this is a recent estimate of the total liability the investment treaties create for the transition away from fossil fuels. It's a vast sum, but consider that, as I said, a larger, uh, it doesn't take into account these other cases. Um, there are tens of billions of uh, dollars of claims already involving government changes to renewable energy policy and hundreds of billions more in claims related to extractives. Um, ISDS doesn't get uh, the stuff out of the ground sooner. And this is another point that I, I believe um, Stephanie made, which is quite important. You know, um, it's going to get in the way of trying to address the climate emergency in other ways, not just phasing out fuels, but trying to get the minerals we need um, to the extent we need them in a responsible way. It's going to it's going to affect how and how quickly we roll out or change our renewable energy policy. It just frustrates uh, our ability to set policies. Uh, in ways and to, and to stumble our way through these new policy areas, right? Uh, because it pretends that there should be this certainty for, for foreign investors that just doesn't exist in, in reality. So ISDS is grossly unjust. It, it preserves power and balances again and unnecessarily complicates uh, our lives. So final slide is the backlash. Um, this is the good news slide. We, we've been fighting ISDS for so long, uh, but the struggle is bearing fruit in many parts of the world, including within the ISDS industry, the, balance, the imbalances in the system have become evident and countries are pushing harder for reform and termination. The picture here shows a vote this week, actually, um, in, in uh, a trade committee of the European Parliament and another committee, an industry committee, both voted to take the entire European Union out of the Energy Charter Treaty, the world's largest ISDS treaty. This is completely good news and it looks like the plenary, the full parliament in Europe is going to make the same decision very soon uh, by the summer. So um, too often, um, I would say though, that these pushes for harder reform, these pushes for more reform and termination, too often a lot of this stuff is still takes the form of kind of modest and I would say mostly meaningless changes to the, to the most problematic investor protections. For example, the fair and equitable treatment rules and the areas around regulatory expropriation. Um, and, and then there's these modest improvements to the transparency of the ISDS proceedings. But the model itself is retained. And, and I use Canada as an example here. In Canada's case, the government is actually, you know, even though we, we got rid of it in the USMCA with respect to the United States, the Canadian government is still trying to expand um, ISDS through new free trade agreements. And it's trying in existing trade agreements to expand the use of ISDS by small and medium sized companies. So for example, with the Europeans, we're talking about a so-called expedited arbitration process, whereby small and medium-sized enterprises, less than 400 employees in Canada's case, um, could, could get access to this rapid uh, and single arbitrator version of ISDS. So it's even less, it's even more arbitrary in the sense there's only one person deciding whether the policy is right or wrong. Um, and, and you get this special um, uh, privileged access to a, a faster process. Um, it's worth pointing out that virtually all of Canada's mining companies are small and medium-sized enterprises. So we know exactly who this is designed to benefit in the long run. It's going to make cases uh, much more likely. Canada is one of the largest sources of mining-related ISDS cases around the world. So I'm going to uh, leave it there. The, again, the good news is, as, as you can see in the slide, the talks are happening everywhere, you know, at the same time, Tanzania just canceled its treaty with, with Canada, which is great news. Um, and there's countries like India, South Africa, who refuse to sign very standard ISDS treaties. Uh, and again, the USMCA, just to repeat, Stephanie, it's an important point. we got to build on this. we got to build on this victory in the USMCA case and, and the change of heart in the Biden administration, um, however we can. So, so thanks very much. And I look forward to 
Manuel's presentation. Manuel, um, Perez Rocha, he's an associate fellow of the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, an associate of the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam. He's a Mexican national who has led efforts to promote just and sustainable alternative approaches to trade and investment agreements for two decades. Prior working for IPS Global e uh, Economy Program, he worked with the Mexican Action Network on Free Trade and continues to be a member of that coalition's executive committee. He also worked for the Make Trade Fair campaign of Oxfam International. Manuel studied international relations at the National Autonomous University of Mexico and has a diploma on European studies from the Autonomous Technological Institute of Mexico and holds an MA on developmental studies from the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague, Netherlands. Some of his last publications include op-eds in The Nation and New York Times. Uh, Manuel, are you ready to talk to us? <laughs> uh, I would uh, just like to add one thing to what Stuart said about the positive note, and it's the history about how we have, I mean, we, I'm talking about hundreds of NGOs and social organizations in the world, we have been defeating since the 90s, the larger schemes from Western governments to implement, um, to enact investment protection in larger free trade agreements. First of all, the multilateral agreement on investment that was pretended in the OECD, the Club of the Rich Countries, that would create a charter of investment protections around the world, was defeated. That fight against the MAI led to the protests of Seattle against the WTO, because once the MAI was defeated, there was a pretense that the WTO, the World Trade Organizations that work on trade issues, not on the investment issues, would take on the investment agenda and the, and the investment rights under its wing. This was one of the big reasons why Seattle happened, that big protest of Seattle. And then again in Cancun in 2003, and the WTO was defeated. Civil society defeated the WTO. Then we defeated the Free Trade Agreement of the Americas, the pretense of um, the Bush, of George Bush, of expanding NAFTA to the rest of the hemisphere. And it was defeated, I would say, mainly because of investment rules, the investment chapter that was pretended there. Also, of course, agriculture and other issues that Latin Americans saw very clearly how much it had affected to Mexico. NAFTA had affected in Mexico. And Latin Americans, other Latin American countries said, no way. And the free trade agreement of the Americas was defeated. And more lately, the TTIP, the transatlantic investment, sorry, the TTIP, the trans. The transatlantic free trade agreement that was being negotiated between the United States and Europe was also largely defeated because action here in the US, but also in mostly in Germany, of fear of these investment rules in the in the TTIP. Let me think what else. Well, that's 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 I think very important to see how we have put uh our knee in the efforts of Western governments uh, to expand investment protections through free trade agreements. However, these free trade agreements exist and bilateral investment treaties exist. There are more than almost 3,000 bilateral investment treaties enacted. And one of the, and this is, this is a, I'm just coming to my presentation here and I hope I don't have technological problems because what I want to, focus on is that the most sued region in the world under ISDS is Latin America. Um, from Mexico to Argentina, we have like a third or so of all the suits around the world. And most important, the most costly ones, perhaps. 
So I'm going to try to share my screen. My screen. <laughs> All right. So this is a document. I'm not going to do a PowerPoint presentation. I'm cheating. I'm just going to our web page and just want to present our uh, document we did like three years ago, but that we're working on updating it. And we hope to have an update uh, later this year. And it's a document called Extraction Casino. It's about how mining companies gamble with Latin American lives and sovereignty through international arbitration. I co-authored it with my colleague, Jen Moore, who used to work for Mining Watch. Now she's an associate fellow of IPS. And we reported uh, 38 cases. That was 2019. Today, we can talk about more than 50, just in four more years of mining companies that have been filing dozens of multi-million dollar claims against Latin American countries in what I underline supranational arbitration panels. Normally they call exit, well, exit calls itself international and normally they call it international arbitration, but it's not international because it's not among, among states. It's not among, among governments. It is really about, as Stephanie uh, explained, it is mainly about tribunals that decide above the consultation or above the participation of states. It's, that's why I call it supranational. It's above the states. It's about the nations. And in this document, we see how Latin America has been targeted. In 2019, it was already badly targeted. Now it's much worse by mining companies. Of course, as Stuart says, said, also by oil and gas companies, but it's very important to put uh, to put uh, underline how important it is to tackle mining mining companies, because today there's a trend in the green transition to say we must pass from oil from fossil fuels to to critical minerals that would uh, allow a green a green transition. However, this passage to, to, to mining, it's very, very damaging for communities in Latin America and of course all around the world and even in the United States where indigenous, you know, indigenous communities are rising, rising because of the damage that increasing mining is is, is doing. No? So some of the key findings that we have is that, uh, well, for example, how Colombia, Mexico, Uruguay are facing billions and I'm, and I'm, I'm saying billions of, which is uh, thousands of millions of of, uh, of liability around their efforts to, around specific efforts to protect uh, vulnerable communities, vulnerable lands, vulnerable vulnerable areas, no? And in the case of, uh, well, both Stephanie and me are Mexican, we have two cases of mining companies one in each side of the country, one in each one in uh, each paradise, one of them in Baja California Sur of a US company called Odyssey, who is suing Mexico of $3.5 billion because they're trying to do seabed mining to extract phosphate. And the Mexican government denied the permit because fishing, fishing communities uh, stood up. The other one is in Playa del Carmen in the Caribbean where Vulcan is suing Mexico for a little bit more than a billion dollars because the government of Lopez Obrador decided to uh, shut down a mining quarry that was affecting the people of the surrounding areas, the indigenous people of the surrounding areas in Playa del Carmen in the Caribbean. Both paradise places where American and Canadian and European and other tourists go, but they don't see the damage that mining companies are doing. And despite Mexico taking the responsibility, the responsible decision of shutting down or, or not allowing the, per the permit in the case of Baja California, Mexico is being sued for by only by those two companies for more than $4 billion. In total today, Mexico is being sued for more than $11 billion in known cases, because in many, in many instances, we don't even know uh, the, the amount of where it, several cases uh, are being, the amount of uh, from which several cases are being sued. So in this um, 
I think an important thing in this document is that we we prove the justifications that mining companies use to pursue supranational arbitration. And we found that one third of the cases examined, um, one third of the cases examined dispute government measures related to indigenous rights and community consent. Nine of these were brought by companies without any operating mine at the time of arbitration. That means that they use a clause called and direct expropriation. What does that mean? It means it's not a direct, it's not a, a direct expropriation where you, you take uh, the, the facility or you take the land or you take the property of someone for which you should be directly compensated. And direct expropriation means, and this is one of the most important critiques of ISDS, and direct expropriation means that you have to, a company should be compensated for the lost profit, for the lost expected profit. If a company expected to have a, a million or a billion dollars of profit, but didn't get it because it didn't, the, the permit wasn't allowed, then the government has to compensate it. This is absolutely ridiculous. And this is one of the things that not only ISDS, the capacity to take countries to a supranational tribunal, but also this and direct expropriation clause has to be completely terminated from the investment rules. Also, over half of cases uh, of the mining companies that dispute government measures concerning the enforcement of environmental and health protections. 15 of these were brought by companies without any operating mine at the time of arbitration. Again, and direct, and direct expropriation. And then over one third of cases, dispute government measures related to resource man management, including nationalization or taxation. And again, five of these were brought by companies without any operating mine at the time of arbitration. So this is what we call it an extra extraction casino. These mining companies, as well as oil, gas, and other companies, just use the ISDS system as a casino. They just come and and uh, dictate or decide, well, this is what we lost, like a billion dollars in lost profit. And normally, of course, the decisions of the tribunals are uh, are files, come these files are, they decide upon much lesser figures. But again, this is why the casino, do we not call it a casino? The, the higher they go, the, the, the low, the, the higher they would expect the, the tribunal to decide in their favor, no? Well, this is the, the document. I hope you can access it. Uh, we have all the rules here explained, which are the rules that the tribunals take into account. These, these so-called tribunals don't take into account uh, human rights, environmental rights, uh, or any of the arguments that communities could come up with because communities are not even heard. All they care is about the specific rules like indirect expropriation, like fair and equitable treatment. This one sounds very nice, very fair, but they just decide without any jury jurisprudence, um, without any... Um, Prior, uh, prior consideration of prior cases, they they just can decide on fair and equitable treatment upon mere, you know, uh, mere uh, their own decisions to without any jurisprudence. And then you have full protection and security, which also obliges governments to protect to so to protect companies uh, and their operations for example, from local and community resistance. Uh, when one company, there's a case in Mexico where uh, where people have stopped the company from going into their lands to mine, and that has provoked the Canadian mining company to sue Mexico for not acting to remove the people from their, from stopping their, their operations and their the trucks and their convoys and so on. Just to, I think I'm going a little bit long, but just to to show a little bit of what we got in the report, 
this is the increase uh, along the years, and as well as Stephanie said, from the nine the end of the nineties, the use of ISDS exploded, and you can see how it has been. As again, I said we have to update it very soon, and we will update it. But in the last, particularly in the last decade, you can see how uh, ISDS cases just uh, exploded particularly in the mining, oil, and gas sector. And, well, yeah, the same. And also, among all the ISDS cases, um, you can see that oil, gas, and mining is the sector that is being used the most. And the distribution of cases, I had said it, Central America and South America, and that doesn't include Mexico, which would make it bigger, is this the region that is the most sued and well most of the cases favor investor 25 percent and so on so we have graphs and here is a graph of which are the closest the closest that they use the most and you see how indirect expropriation is the one that has been the most invoked as well as the most found by the tribunals um gas cases for you will do all right well i think I'll, I'll leave it at this there's lots to lots more to talk about and um just what i'm very happy is that like being with Stuart and with stephanie we're just three the three of us are just part of a very very large community of people trying to end up end this isds system around the world and to yeah look forward to uh more fair, um, more fair free trade and an investment system uh, globally. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Manuel, Stuart, and Stephanie for sharing and sticking with us. Uh, it was a lot of information, and we're going to be uh, putting this on on our web page and and uh, promoting it as as a recording thank you very much thanks for having us thank you all yeah, so thank much. you terry thanks Great. everyone Take okay. care. good night bye good night bye, -bye. thanks